Uh, okay, we're in the home stretch here for the open session. Uh, next up is the council initiated discussion. And again, for the new council members, this is an opportunity for you to uh, tell us uh, important issues that are uh, coming to the fore. Uh, if you want reports uh, in future council meetings, you can suggest them at this time. You are also representatives of the community. And so if you hear grumblings or problems uh, that uh, you feel we should be aware of, this is an opportunity to bring that to our attention as well. Well, we also take compliments, right? It doesn't have to just be <laughs> grumblings or problems. If you hear things in the community that are positive, you can share those with us. Too. I think we know, what's the, what's the old saw that a satisfied customer tells one person, but a disgruntled customer tells five or something like that? So we're used to that treatment. Uh, related to grumblings, this is not sp specific to, to genome, but uh, but it is something I'm hearing a lot. Uh, is the complaints that the NIH isn't uh, acting as they should when it comes to the and this is all I don't know I don't know the details. This is what I hear. Oh, the, it relates to global warming, and there's some talk about that we that there have been that it's no longer can can be mentioned in some web pages. I don't I haven't seen any strong evidence, but I see people complaining about that. Wow. Okay. Um, I'll try to answer this and just remember this is why they pay me the big bucks. Um, it's it's sensitive, right? I mean I think you could imagine um, a, a, a series of topics that um, in light of the new administration's views um, that we should probably be very careful to make sure that um, uh, the broader NIH's research agenda is not viewed to uh, play into positions that would, that the, uh, the administration, current administration would find um, um, unacceptable. And, you know, we are, we are part of the executive branch, so we are fully accountable to um, the current administration. And so there are a number of things that we have to, you know, um, respect their views about and have to abide by. And, and mostly what we're, I think that we're trying to do is to not let things that on the edges um, in any way inflame circumstances that would harm NIH's, you know, broader mission um, and being very uh, concerned about budget and policies and so forth. So I think there are examples. Some of them are, have been written about. In, in the scientific press, which is probably a better place to at least get some of the facts, uh, uh, or at least a representation of the facts, um, because they're, they are, they do involve, you know, certain decisions that have been made, or certain things that may or may not be up on web pages and so forth. But it's the practical reality that we are living in now with the new administration who was voted in. They have their positions and attitudes about certain topics. You named one. There's others. Carol, a compliment. I really like your tie. Oh, thank Eric. you very much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, so I was wondering how much discussion there is between NHGRI and, say, ORIP in terms of possible projects that have, so the office of. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, so ORIP. this is the. Um, Office of Research Infrastructure, right? Um, so there are there are some efforts within there are some efforts within ORIP that seem to complement or synergize with NHGRI. And the the component in particular, this is a, a previous component of N, of the National Center for Research That's Resources. That's right. So, you know, so, so, so that so, that sort of became into a bunch of fragments right. and landed in various places. Is right. a particular Right. Oh, you're so, talking about ORIP, and where does that well, there's reside? a lot of there's a lot of um, informatics components to yeah. what ORIP is currently supporting that links model organisms to disease relevance. And I'm wondering if there's if there's been any discussion with how to if there's possibilities for synergism. This all goes back in part to the to the bench to bedside and and back again and in the infrastructure that's needed to really advance basic science for clinical impact. 
And I, so I'm just wondering if there has been any discussion. It sounds like maybe there hasn't. But. Well, I, I'm not sure there's anything. I don't think there's been any direct discussion with OREP. I can't even remember where it landed. And did it land in GMS? Or, I mean, you don't even know what institute. I don't know if anybody in the back knows. Oh, it's now, so it's now being administered out of the common fund? Is that one of these pieces? Out of Deep Poughkeepsie. So I don't know specifically, Carol. So, I mean, if you gave us some details, if you think it's, it's not, almost sounded like you were describing sort of a data resource. And if true, if so, it, that could, it may already be getting discussed within broader um, meetings and strategic planning around data science, but I've not heard yeah. anything specific okay. about OREP. So I, maybe okay. I'm just ignorant, but I don't, I'm not seeing anybody in my staff jumping yeah. up as if they knew. Okay. So maybe you could inform us offline, and maybe we could try to dig a little and make sure we're not missing an opportunity. Right. Because you're that's, raising that's that might what be an I'm opportunity. Looking for. Yeah. So okay. tell us more details offline, Great. and Thank we you. will follow up. Yeah, Trey. Yeah. So given the nice presentation by Larry Tabak this morning about the Next Generation Researchers Initiative, I think it's called. Yep. I thought it might be worth having just a little bit of of NHGRI specific discussion. So I think the the um, the point at which he said that that analysis that he provided was, was really for R01s mm. caused some pause because, in fact, this institute has some R01s, is my understanding, but, but mostly not R01s. And so, I, you know, the, the, the broad question would be, have you guys done your own analysis along those lines? Because it could be really quite, you know, insightful. I wonder whether... Is the problem exacerbated by U01s and U24s, for instance? Or, you know, I anecdotally know quite a few young PIs of U01s, yep. you know, at this institute. So, so I, ironically, it could even go the other way, and I, I would be very interested to know, you know, and I'm sure others would too. So let me, let me try to answer your, I don't have an answer to your question. Let me try to respond to what you said. First of all, I think bringing this back to council is, a, is, is sort of maybe what I heard as an action. We're not ready to do this now. But I think maybe as a follow-up, and that would make sense exactly. anyway, yeah. because what's going to happen is that as this is getting rolled out, and we are, it's already happened even for this year, where they said, we really hope you can, inc you know, th this is the target we'd love for you to have for our scorecard. And then we had to go look to see how many of those we had already were going to fund and how many we might have to reach for, blah, blah, blah. And so, and that's going to continue um, even next fiscal year and beyond. And, we, and so we started looking at this, and there were even some, and I'm just, and any staff want to jump up to microphones if I don't represent this as well as they, there's a lot of work that went on by staff, even dealing with definitions and how they were, you know, because they're doing bulk analysis and all of a sudden there's always a million little exceptions along the way. So just reconciling their data and ours. And so maybe it speaks to your point is they may do an analysis in a certain way and it may misrepresent some of the unique nuances of our portfolio. And so we might even be achieving what they want, even though we may not be getting credit for it. We, maybe we're achieving it in a different way. We need them to broaden their or change their definitions. And maybe that's what you're getting at, is to use an NHGRI lens to their what they're trying to achieve. Very well said, Eric. Yeah. Thank you. So I don't know, Chris, if you want to add to it, but I mean, Chris did a lot of, a lot of work in doing this, and we've learned a lot. And it's, we've learned a lot when it was a moving target, because recall, it was even had a different three-letter abbreviation, and then it morphed to something else, and we're like trying to play catch-up. So we're getting used to this, and we're going to actually have to get more sophisticated because there's going to be reporting and scrutiny and justification going on. And, but at the same time, I, I like what you said, is we want to be able to look at this and say maybe we have, for our community of researchers, ways to achieve the same goals that might maybe we can influence a broader. Yeah, it would be great to hear that report either in an open or a closed session even and just, just have a chance to look at the figures as they apply to this institute only. So, Chris, do you want to take a... So we have looked at it for the NHGRI-specific data. Um, as you said, our distribution of grant activity types is not exactly typical of um, NHGRI and NIH in general. Um, and this is a moving target. So as we learn more, we will but, refine that. But it's going to be really important to understand if those criteria are R01-specific right. and contact PI-specific. Because if we have to start giving out a lot of R01 contact PI grants, that will completely shift the portfolio. I mean, there are a lot of junior faculty who are multi-PI on U01s, and we were talking at the break. It's totally unclear to us if those are counting, you know, but or even like clear those pay. are not being counted right now, but what's not clear is, is what they would do if you were to count them. Well, just for example, we just heard about 
one of the newborn sequencing grants. Jonathan Berg is a junior faculty member. He was a multi-PI on one of those UO1s, and I don't know if that's going to count or not. There, there was a guide notice released that went into a little bit of detail on that. They, in brief, they said they would use the same principles that are used for early stage investigators, so all investigators have to qualify, for the grant at large to qualify. That is what is in the guide notice, and I believe it was limited to RPG grants, which are include R01s, but is a little bit broader than that. So then, then you wouldn't, those grants would not count. So we will, this will be a good follow-up topic. To be continued. Oh, and it'll be continued at a corporate level, so no matter what, we're going to have to be tracking this, justifying it, thinking about it, so forth. Yeah, Carolyn. But on that same note, and one of the things that came up in what Chris was looking at that I think will be important for us to include with council is also to look within NHGRI at who is it that we potentially are leaving on the table, because we actually do relatively well. You know, one of the things that we looked at for, for FY17 is, who were the people, if this, if this policy were more strictly inf involved, you know, we do already for R01s look at early stage investigators and have some of these considerations. So I think that's another aspect to it is, you know, that we can't fund an applicant, applicant who doesn't fit the definition if we don't have someone there, you know, to fund. So I think we're going to want to look at that in our portfolio as well. So we can do the analysis. I'll also point out, I think Tayback had cited an increase of 200 investigators with that number. With our budget being 1.7% of the NIH budget, if we pick up three people, I think we'll, we'll, be, we'll meet the challenge. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but I, I maybe to Trey's point, which I think is really where you're heading is, and, and we've already seen this, I don't, I don't think we're going to have trouble meeting the goal, the numerical goals that Building one puts out, the OD puts out, because you're right, it's going to be two or three. We've almost made it this year, you know, with almost no effort and blindly we made. So that, but with that said, the overall intention is probably one that's worth us thinking about. And then we should look at our community with our suite of grants, our style of doing science, and just making sure we're leaving no one behind, we're, you know, all the curves are going the right way the best we can, because I think we're sufficiently anomalous that our curves might be a little different than the the, the, the main NIH curves, which are swamped out, especially by the big institutes. Yeah, yeah so, Brent, go ahead. Yeah, and just related to that, um, you know, maybe there isn't an ESI problem in NHGRI. So maybe, I mean, shouldn't it be that each institute should have a certain fraction of total ESI investigators being funded? So, if, I mean, some institutes are maybe particularly low, whereas others may be yeah. high, and so the there kind of thing no we are going to want to add anymore. Right. But, and again, I'm not I, against funding ESIS, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. And Jay, do you have, uh, Jay's been in more of these conversations yeah. because of the ACD involvement. I mean, it seems like, I mean, this is just echoing maybe things that were just said, but NHGRI is small enough that, I mean, some kind of hardcore mathematical analysis isn't really going to bear fruit just because it's so small and the number of investigators is small enough that you can, I can imagine a more subjective analysis that's really just focused on looking looking like I think people have been saying for people who are getting left on the table with fundable good science but but not you know you know not getting funded and who are those people um, and, and do they include young investigators and 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 finding ways to fund them right yeah I mean back to um, something Eric I think just underscored I, I think the concern isn't so much for this particular mechanism where I think I think we'd agree it's going to have a, a minor impact regardless but it's the broader spirit of just I, I think you know council taking stock, you know, of are, are we making good by junior investigators or are we not making good by junior investigators and either, you know, looking at trends and whether those trends are stable or not, we'll have to see. But regardless, anecdotally, looking at averages, you know, assess that and decide whether we should do something yep. or maybe feel good about ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, this topic... I mean, earlier today, much earlier today, we had a brief conversation about the, the, some of the experiments being done at other institutes, funding investigators more than projects, and we're going to talk about that. I mean, these, these topics actually do intersect. I mean, the question is, is there a population of genomics researchers that we could be helping get on their feet, maintain their feet, et cetera, et cetera? And so these are all, you know, and are there experiments we should uniquely do because of the configuration of our portfolio or the uniqueness of the science we do. So I think these are 
probably joint topics in some ways. I, yeah, I want to, in a way, second that. That I don't think we should. I would prefer not to talk about helping junior faculty, although that sounds nice. What we want to do is fund the best science, and and if if funding junior people is is what gets us there, then that's what we do. But in general, you want to avoid missing potential groundbreaking research, et cetera. Well, no question. The, the 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 problem is sort of at the at the margins, and and then and then sort of a whole set of issues. Oh boy, we've talked about this a lot at Institute Direction. Just sort of these circumstances where probably the review process cannot discriminate between you know three or four, but somehow you're about to end somebody's research academic research career if you're not careful, and the scores are right at the edge of fundability. Well, so and you can discourage the future generation from entering. I do just think it's very important to think of the law of unintended consequences. No question. And so if, for example, all the investigators have to be early stage, then that will influence how people apply. Um, and so, I mean, these are just the kinds of things I think we should make sure we understand. And because of the size of the institute, it may not influence us very much, right. but I can see NIH-wide that could have a big influence. And, and maybe what Raphael was reacting to is I think there is, there is negative and positive measures one can take. Setting a line and saying you have to fund this number of people is unquestionably a negative because you're, you're, you're kicking out excellent proposals. You're leapfrogging excellent proposals to do that. But of course, and we can debate the merits of, do, of doing that, but of course there's positive uh, strategic changes one could make if, if there is indeed a problem even and we just don't even know. A second rule. No, we have a 10 second rule. A 10 second rule for top. Oh, okay. But he makes up these rules as he goes along. It's pretty random. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.